in many ways it's the most fulfilling and interesting job that I've ever done because it melded together the two bits that I felt most strongly about international issues because I'd worked uh, overseas in international aid prior to that and Wales as my nation of, of birth and uh, one in which I was and continue to be particularly interested in uh, and therefore this knitted the two parts of that together very well and therefore it was a, a great opportunity to come back to to Cardiff and to Wales to work when I did in the in the mid 1990s I was working for Save the Children Fund mostly in Mozambique for a few years and then immediately prior to the job at the Temple of Peace I was based in London working with Comic Relief on the serious side of their work the, the funding of uh, grant grants for projects in the African continent so that that was the continuum if you like um, and, and this seemed a, a, a natural uh, progression for me and I was chuffed to bits to to get the role it's um an interesting uh, tension and a juxtaposition really because uh, employed by a voluntary charitable organization and let's be frank quite a small uh, charitable organization in such an imposing building where you don't even have the rule of the roost in most of it because giving its full name the Temple of Peace and Health from its inception in 1938 it was the health bit that had had the most staff and had uh, in effect managed the building um, it was an interesting uh, challenge to be responsible for an organization within it and yet be aware that you were based in and sort of spokespeople for uh, a listed building a building here in in Cate's Park in the Civic Center which uh, is cheek by jowl with Welsh government buildings with university buildings with uh, Cardiff City official buildings and therefore there was another arm to the responsibilities where you were aware of a certain uh, heritage responsibility as well for what is quite an imposing structure. Well, it, it's it's good that it it wasn't a common or garden office block. That's for sure. The fact that uh, its whole architectural style is based on things to do with the League of Nations, to do with Geneva, where some of the United Nations buildings are now based. That it's founder and main benefactor Lord Davis of Llandinam had a vision um, which included the archi architectural style as well as what was happening in the building during his lifetime meant that there was a, a, a positive thread taking us back to uh, what he personally had done but what other people in Wales had done in terms of uh, international issues in terms of uh, promoting peaceful uh, relations ever since the early part of the 20th century so that was on occasion an extra weight to carry but on the whole it was a, a pleasant burden to carry forward. I think the, the key um, change uh, in those years end of the millennium uh, were actually to do with Wales as much as overseas. It was the time of the uh, devolution vote in 1997. 
the legislation to create a National Assembly for Wales, which came into being in 1999, and that changed the dynamic of a lot of what we were doing at the Temple of Peace, in that we all of a sudden had a different locus and focus for much of the work that had been going on, whether that be campaigning work, uh, whether that be promoting the importance of uh, international understanding and, and for young people global citizenship. And that was something we, um, I would like to think, um, not only accepted with open arms but were very positive in pursuing in those years of the initial baby steps of a uh, some degree of self-determination for Wales for the first time in all those centuries. For example, we uh, commissioned various pieces of, of work to look at how a, a Welsh Assembly could change in its relationship to the European Union. We added to the work that we did with young people in schools, we're talking here of six formers on the whole, um, we'd had decades of running model United Nations General Assemblies where the teenagers play the roles of different governments. During those years we added to that a model National Assembly for Wales so that they were taking on the roles of, at that time, future elected members of the Welsh Assembly. And um, in the way that we all like to, to dream about things and the plans not always, if indeed ever, quite match up to the dreams. But uh, I remember that um, our trustees, when the National Assembly was up and running, were talking about, well, wouldn't it be a perfect uh, juxtaposition of buildings and of ideals if the Welsh Government were to think of the Temple of Peace as a nascent uh, foreign office, in effect, for their work. Um, that 20 years on from devolution has proved to be perhaps a bit of blue sky thinking that was a little too blue. However, the fact that Wales for Africa program is now based in the Temple of Peace shows that that vision in its more limited form, because uh, however one feels uh, about the way that devolution has developed, um, there have been changes along the way and the Wales for Africa program is a small but important example of those. Did you help to initiate that project? Um, <coughs> yes, uh, we did as an organisation, not alone by any means, but in combination with a number of the uh, aid agencies based in Wales, your Oxfams, your CAFODs, Christian Aids, Save the Children, um, we did a fair amount of lobbying and advocacy work in the early 2000s to convince some of the politicians that uh, it was feasible, even within the pretty restricted political settlement that they had for the National Assembly, to be doing something with an international flavour. And in particular, uh, we can puff our chests out a bit in terms of the Temple of Peace, I believe, that we were part of convincing Rodri Morgan, then First Minister, uh, to change from being a big sceptic, uh, in fact in a particular meeting, saying this just isn't on the cards, it's not part of our role, to, uh, by 2005-2006, establishing this embryonic uh, programme. Part of my esteem for, for Rodri Morgan is he always did have a, a, a 
much bigger, broader perspective on things, um, and was very committed to global issues. Uh, what changed? Well, I, I guess we were pains in that we kept on knocking and changing our argument a bit and pointing out new facts and figures. But equally as important, I guess, is that he saw as uh, the legal structure of the Assembly changed, as Welsh Government changed in its relationship to the National Assembly, that uh, there could be and should be a justified uh, role that it played in, in this particular area. And yes, I believe the, the constraint and the wording is retained even to this day that it has to show benefits to the people of Wales and there's a focus here, but yeah, you can be creative in, in explaining that and, and uh, justifying that whilst ensuring that much of the uh, relationship and much of the benefit is for whatever community or organisation you're linking up with in African countries, uh, be that small community groups or, or larger non-governmental organisations. The if we looked at one-off events, I suppose the f there were some particularly memorable uh, speakers that we had. We had uh, Oscar Arias, the president of Costa Rica, uh, speaking. And Costa Rica is a small but important country in uh, terms of those people who are interested in, in peace issues because it is the, the sole example of a country without a standing army um, and he has been a, a great advocate of, of that uh, over the years. We had uh, Rowan Williams, Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, um, who gave a, a stirring address on uh, international issues and using his uh, redoubtable press and PR office, it was front page of the Guardian newspaper the following day. Those are the sort of uh, spins we can only dream of at, uh, at the Temple of Peace, but th that was uh, a good and positive one. We had, um, it, it was quite nice, again, a decade or so earlier, we had José Ramos Horta, who uh, went on to become the leader of East Timor. It was in the period actually when East Timor had just had its independence from Indonesia um, after a pretty horrendous conflict over, over many years and Ramos Horta had been an important uh, freedom fighter in previous decades and then transformed himself into uh, a statesman um, and that was a, a good example of an evening where, um, and I'm pleased to say, we had a few of these. The audience was not silent, merely erupting to appla applause at the, the end of the evening. We had a few Indonesian students, I believe, possibly studying at, at Cardiff University, planted in the audience who were at various stages heckling and at the end certainly asking, well not so much asking questions as, as putting strongly held uh, alternative points of view to him. Um, and that's... And how did he react to that? He dealt well, with that. he was uh, already a, a, an experienced uh, person on rebutting those things. And I think with the added uh, importance of having the independence of East Timor as a, a passionate cause that he believed in, um, he was more than capable of uh, quietening what they had to, to say on the matter. Well, we've um, had quite a few 
uh, people linked to the United Nations, various uh, Under Secretary Generals. We were never quite able to get the the top job Secretary General here uh, as a speaker. Um, diplomats, representatives of aid agencies. We had uh, Emir Jones Parry, um, who subsequently, after my time, uh, became the president of the Welsh Centre for International Affairs when he returned to live in Wales. But for many years in the decade after um, 2000, he was a, a senior diplomat, first the ambassador, the United Kingdom ambassador to NATO in Brussels, and then the UK's man in New York as its uh, ambassador to the United Nations. So he brought a, a wealth of uh, inside information on global issues when, when he came to, to speak and has, as I mentioned, contributed in different ways since his return to live in Wales. One of the um, many things which uh, I remember constantly being uh, browbeaten about was um, the need to, to modernise the building. This is going back to this uh, balancing act to an extent of running an organisation with members of staff and a series of events and work programmes and yet being based in a building that quite rightly was considered to be of, uh, of importance in itself. And uh, the fact that little work had been done on the building since it was opened in 1938 meant that by uh, the time we celebrated the 60th anniversary in 1998, um, we finally were able to present a, a funding bid to the Heritage Lottery Fund to improve a whole host of things that by then had become necessary but weren't the norms in the 1930s. Better disabled access, uh, a lift in the building, uh, improved landscaping around the building and even some information for the public and passers-by. That's right, because given its uh, minimalist 1930s Art Deco style, um, you will note that both inside and outside it, there's very little uh, excess uh, and in fact uh, nowhere will you see the name of the building mentioned other than on the uh, information boards which were put up after this successful Heritage Lottery bid. I think it's getting um, some of the projects that have happened in more recent years that, that has um, both expanded the, the number of staff so that the more recent, again, Heritage Lottery Fund project uh, on the centenary of World War I has clearly enabled the centre to go into depth on, on some of the historical things to do with itself and more importantly uh, broadly with people in Wales on the whole issue of, of war and peace which uh, is very exciting I think I would say that is an example after my period there, which uh, has helped to uh, extend the, the reach of the organisation. I also quite like the Peace Garden, which is a, a more recent uh, addition. Um, I only hope that uh, the genius behind the Peace Capsule, Robert Davis, has ensured that someone somewhere knows where it's buried. Okay, so it's the 80th anniversary yeah. of the Temple of Peace. Um, 
do you think the building and the, and the work that goes on there still has a relevance today? Uh -huh. um, clearly, the, the, the work has evolved uh, over those uh, decades um, and continues to change and that to me maybe is an answer to your question. The fact that it does continue means that it has proved its relevance. Um, many institutions and organizations uh, flourish for a few years and then quite naturally die away. So that none of the named institutions of 1938 are still there. The world has moved on, uh, those bodies have changed and evolved, but uh, I believe much of the founding intentions continue to be represented by organisations like the Welsh Centre for International Affairs and its project work. Um, and there undoubtedly continues to be uh, a need and a, a role for it to play in what it does. I think uh, it's got a more easily described role now perhaps following devolution 20 years on from the uh, settlement that gives Wales a, a form of government of its own the fact that this is a Welsh national institution that we're talking about means that it can play a, um, a part in a political unit which is the same shape and size as it is. Perhaps an, an example on that. Early on in my time in the late 1990s the big international campaign was uh, on um, bringing in an anti-landmine international treaty and we at the World Centre for International Affairs played a small part in that. But we were, there was nothing within Wales to which clearly we could inform people, we could uh, carry out events which raised awareness about the issues, but there was no decision-making uh, politically representative body on which we could naturally uh, bring pressure to bear. That has changed and I think that's, that's a positive thing which makes the institution's work um, that much more pointed, if you, if you like. Perhaps it may have lost something along the way as well because Lord Davis as the founder had this vision of the League of Nations Union as a an international body that would maintain peace, would be given the capabilities of uh, its own policing force to do that um, and clearly uh, the successor body, namely the United Nations, uh, has failed in that perhaps unrealisable uh, aspect um, now that we look back uh, over all the, the conflicts that have continued to occur after World War II. But that doesn't uh, in any way undermine the importance of striving for some of those ideals and putting some of them into, into practice. I'm still committed to them, yes. I, I, um, I don't think I've deviated much from uh, the, the things that I held to be important. Um, and I still, not so much in my day job, but in some of my voluntary uh, and activist roles, uh, continue to make a, a small contribution to uh, things of international relevance and, and of political importance. 
um, and and that's why I reiterate a bit of what I said earlier that it, it's uh, in many ways it, it, it was a pleasure to be um, employed to do uh, those sort of things for the best part of uh, 14 years at the at the Welsh Centre for International Affairs it was a a privilege to to have that role neither of my parents had uh, lived overseas uh, my father served overseas in India in World War two but um, there wasn't any great uh, past background which uh, pointed me in that direction um, it, it possibly showed itself in my case first when as an 18 year old I went to volunteer overseas not through UNA exchange but uh, through a longer term volunteering program um, and, and that well looking back from this distance 40 years or so on uh, yeah you I can see that that gave me a whetted my my appetite for for that uh, sort of of interest and activity what would you like to say to the um, I think uh, it's uh, a building which will continue to play uh, an important role in Welsh uh, civil life um, and with the Welsh Centre for International Affairs and its associated bodies there, uh, there is a continuing role for the people who work there to shape and influence the Wales of the future um, as part of civil society in Wales. And the international aspect um, is something which is as important as ever. Um, some would say politically uh, in British and Welsh terms at the moment uh, it's more relevant than ever to be allowing that uh, international view on life to, to be expressed and to give people the opportunity to, to get involved with it as we go through continuing uh, political and economic changes. So um, its centrality to that I'm sure will continue and I wish it well for its uh, centenary and onwards and upwards from there into the future as well.